Thank you, Joe. Hi, everybody. I hope you can see the screen clearly and hear me well. Uh, thank you, Katie, for that amazing talk just now. It's incredible. Um, we're really pleased to be here uh, to talk to you, uh, with you, about open access and cultural heritage and about how Andrea and I in recent years have put together uh, a global survey of what we call Open Glam. So without further ado, let's briefly introduce ourselves. Andrea, over to you. Who are you? <laughs> Who am I? ask it every day. Um, I'm Andrea Wallace. I'm a senior lecturer in law at the University of Exeter. Um, a lot of my research focuses on how cultural heritage institutions make their collections available online and um, the intellectual property issues around that. Um, over to you, Doug. I've been working in cultural heritage and museums uh, with a focus on copyright and licensing for almost 20 years now. And so I'm currently working at Europeana Foundation, uh, based here, speaking to you from the Netherlands. And so uh, open access to cultural heritage is a real kind of passion and interest of mine, and it's something that Andrea and I share. So GLAM, you've seen it in the title, but in case you're not aware, not sure what it means. Uh, GLAM stands for Galleries, Libraries, Archives and Museums. Uh, it's a you know, useful shorthand and it encompasses really the whole world of cultural heritage. So if there are cultural collections, museum type collections that are held in non strictly glam institutions, maybe like libraries, uh, sorry, like uh, universities, then um, those can also uh, be encompassed, can fall into the definition. So what is open glam? Um, we there's actually two parts to this question. Open Glam is a movement that stands for Open Galleries, Libraries, Archives, and Museums, and it's looking at digital collections and how those are made available online, particularly for reuse by the public. Um, and the second part of that is what does open mean? Because um, there are often a lot of understandings around open access and open data or open GLAM that don't necessarily match on to the international standards, which require materials to be freely accessible, usable, and that can be modified and shared for any purpose, including commercial purposes. And so that's usually the kicker right there. Um, it has to be made available for commercial reuse. Um, and if it's not, then it doesn't meet the international standards for open access, which means open glam in this instance is digital collections that are made available online for any purpose whatsoever, including commercial reuse. So just over three years ago, our mutual friend, Simon Tan, who's based in London, uh, put out this tweet asking for a quick shortlist a few examples of why CC0, so that's the, the legal tool from Creative Commons for full liberal open access, is great, you know, it's good for museums uh, because he wanted to convince the museum to go open access. So uh, simple question and there was a longer answer which is, has taken over three years since. Uh, so uh, in the Twitter thread that followed uh, Andrea and I and a few other kind of open glam activists and interested people shared a few examples uh, but we quickly realized that actually a list of any sort that was even reasonably like uh, you know, uh, encyclopedic or you know, representative actually didn't uh, didn't exist so we thought well no maybe maybe we should make one so why did we start what we call the open gland survey well first of all there was no there was a lack of up-to-date information on the topic. I mean, there had been a couple of surveys, uh, I think there'd been a, a Wikimedia project around open access a few years before, um, but uh, as with often with projects, uh, people move on, the data gets old really, really quickly. So uh, yeah, there was nothing up-to-date. There's also no shared place to kind of see and particularly to add relevant data um, in this field. and. I think Andrea and I shared a sense that there was a perceived kind of very Anglophone, European and North American bias in the field, that open glam was totally dominated by national or massive museums. And uh, so we really wanted to discover uh, the global picture of open glam. And who is the survey for? Well, it's for people who want to find and use open content or data. Uh, and of course, you know, open data in the glam space is incredibly varied. 
And also, uh, we wanted something, uh, a resource for glands who were thinking about open access, maybe starting it, uh, dipping their toe in the water or going further with open access, open data, and to really understand what their peers were doing around this topic. So those are the key motivations. So um, what our survey actually collects is we kind of start and think about um, how GLAMs make this data available, um, whether it's digital objects, metadata, or text, um, and available for reuse. And so we kind of start with that idea that um, Obviously, there's a lot of objects that are held by cultural institutions. Many of those objects have passed into the public domain, which means there's no copyright on them. There's no copyright restrictions in making reproductions, and there may be other restrictions that we need to think about. Um, but of course, uh, cultural institutions have been digitizing those and making them available. So then the question becomes whether or not that reproduction, that digital copy, however we want to refer to it, um, is in fact original enough to receive its own copyright protection. So this is where that kind of dynamic of how are institutions making their collections available online centers. So if institutions with public domain objects digitize those and make those available under open standards, that's the entry point for the survey. After that, we end up looking and to see what the right statements are for the metadata or any other text around um, some of the content that's made available online. And we also track the specific license or uh, label that the materials are made available under. So kind of going back to Simon's tweet, you know, he wanted to know specifically what institutions are making things available under the CC0 public domain dedication. Um, so even though we kept coming up with, oh, no, but that institution uses CC BY or this institution uses a public domain mark, you know, these are the types of data points that we find to be useful for people who are starting to think about um, doing this either with their own collection, doing research on Open Glam, even users trying to find collections um, located close to them that they can reuse for any purpose whatsoever. So how do we go about uh, putting the survey together? So the data focus really is GLAM data that focuses on GLAM's data made available either on their own websites, typically collections online, and or a variety of external platforms. And as Andrea said, the focus is on digital surrogates of objects in the public domain, where any term of copyright for the material object has expired or actually never existed in the first place. And the information from the survey is gathered via extensive desk research and importantly, outreach to the wonderful uh, global GLAM community. So thank you again to them. And that can be via Twitter, via email, a variety of, of ways that uh, there is a, an open, open GLAM community out there who put their hand up uh, and let us know when we've missed something or something has changed. So they're an incredibly important part of the whole process. Key data points in the survey, which at its heart is a large Google Sheet, we have institution name that's always recorded in the original language, uh, the country of the institution and the type. So is it a gallery, is it a library, is it a university, for example? Um, there are always direct links to the open GLAM content and the data, uh, including GitHubs and API services. Uh, as Andrea mentioned, that we specify the licenses or the right statements for both the digital surrogates and the metadata. And wherever possible, we link to the GLAM's terms of use and their copyright policies. And finally, uh, there are uh, Wikidata kind of QIDs for every institution in the survey. So one of the things that also helps us with this is going to places that collect this information and doing some searches within that, um, or going straight to data aggregators like Europeana, Japan Search, Trove, and Digital New Zealand. Um, but we also look at Wikimedia Commons, Flickr Commons, CC Search, um, Sketchfab, of course, uh, institutions have been uploading 3D collections under open licenses or public domain dedications, um, and then hackathons, 
where institutions are often digitizing or releasing um, a small set or a sample of data that they've been able to prepare for the purpose of a hack hackathon that then becomes part of, for example, the Coding Da Vinci um, kind of uh, initiative where that data set is then available. Um, and then, of course, there's other open data portals. Um, but the fact that these things are maintained allow us to uh, sort by the license or the label and kind of um, look at the different areas where institutions are trying to make things available, whether that's because there's an aggregator, you know, geographically in the area or because Wikimedia Commons provides a platform that they can use where um, their own institutional website wouldn't be able to support that kind of functionality. The survey has its own, and actually more than one uh, ID in Wikidata. So it's fairly extensively uh, referenced now in Wikidata, which of course, and I know this audience knows this uh, back to front, uh, enables a very sophisticated you know, Sparkle queries and other uh, forms of data interrogation of open cloud. And um, we started, of course, with about 30 cultural institutions trying to think, ooh, what's been on our list? Who have we been tracking? Um, is according to, of course, that open standard um, in March of 2018. And today we now have 1,200 cultural institutions, but also even like government archives or online repositories and um, other types of organizations that aren't maybe a traditional cultural institution, universities, um, but make cultural heritage available um, in, you know, within the parameters of um, what we're collecting, which is like an incredible amount. And I think we just got very close to 60 million openly licensed digital objects linked to from the survey sheet. So I guess that's enough to keep most people going, right? Andrea, over to you. And so also some of what we are doing um, is using the Wikidata um, and uh, wiki maps to be able to run a query so that we can trace the locations of each of the institutions that are represented on the data sheet. Um, so you'll see that there are large clusters and areas that have an aggregator. So we have representation in, in uh, Japan, also New Zealand, um, Europe with Europeana, the United States with DPLA. Um, and so there's obviously uh, a benefit to having these aggregators in terms of like the representation and what it can capture. Um, and we know that we're missing things too. But uh, outside of that, there are institutions doing really creative things in India, in different countries in South America, um, where they're starting to dip their toes in and take smaller approaches to specific data sets or um, initiatives on a collections by collections basis. And um, I would say this is across the board with what we typically see. Some institutions are done adopting an all eligible data approach where basically everything that they can make available because they have either the rights to do that um, or they know that there are no underlying rights in the material is made available for anyone to use. And a, the majority of institutions, I would say at least 75% of the list, make things available on a collections by collections basis, um, which is often because of technology or funding or even grant obligations that come attached to the money that supports the digitization of some, some of these objects. Um, so there's some very different and diverse approaches being taken um, all around the world. And um, yes, so you can also see, of course, if we zoom in that where we have um, Digital Trove and also um, New Zealand, that the representation is there as well. And in the US, um, particularly um, in areas where there are some of the larger institutions or um, really kind of metropolitan areas um, that release information either according to their website or also through DPLA which is Digital Public Libraries of America. And then, of course, in Europe, with Europeana being a, a data aggregator and Doug working there, we always have the latest information um, from new additions to Europeana. So, of course, there are many possibilities of querying, filtering, uh, interrogating the data that I mentioned. Uh, out of the Google Sheet itself, uh, the Open Glam Survey, 
You can, of course, really easily output uh, things like this, uh, pie charts showing country distribution. Uh, so the number of open gland institutions per country, of course, it's a global survey um, with their raw numbers and all the percentages. You can slice and dice the data by institution type, uh, which I mentioned earlier. So um, here you can see that there's around, or well, just over a third of the institutions are museums. Um, libraries are also significant institution type in the survey. So it's really easy and I very much encourage you all uh, when you get to the survey to, to output and play around with it and uh, dig into the data and see what you find. And from a copyright and licensing perspective, um, you, can, uh, you can interrogate the data to look at, say, how many institutions are using the public domain mark versus CC0 or the no known copyright flavors a right statement versus CC BY. So, um, yeah, from a licensing practitioner copyright research perspective, I think it's useful. Andrea. So um, what we've also been learning from this is um, some really interesting things about the sector, which we all know, but it's allowed us to kind of reduce into things that are quantifiable um, and in a way that we can demonstrate um, some of the socioeconomic, technical and human infrastructures that are required and very expensive to support digitization, um, even access, how people are accessing and the quality of data that's made available. Of course, the metrics themselves are designed by areas of the world who see this as a priority. And um, those metrics then control how we are able to kind of capture different examples and um, represent them uh, within the spreadsheet itself. Again, the aggregator distortion effect, because these are large data sets that come forward, um, even with Wikimedia Commons, being able to <coughs> find examples that exist um, that then allow us to enter that data into the spreadsheet. Um, and then, of course, copyright and culture and the culture of copyright, which what that kind of uh, relates to is thinking about um, areas where maybe copyright is actually kind of important to retain because it restricts access and reuse around um, materials that necessarily aren't appropriate, but at the same time, copyright's not always the best way to restrict access to these materials. And we need to be thinking about other ways where we don't use copyright as such a blunt tool um, to kind of tell users what they can and can't do with it. Um, so this culture of copyright is something that, you know, often people say, oh, well, let's let's just claim copyright in it and then people won't be able, you know, to do these things with it, but it's not necessarily the best answer because copyright has an expiration date. Um, and then, of course, there's a very high barrier to entry for open access around this and open glam um, because it requires having someone within the institution or access to someone with the legal knowledge around copyright, which is highly specific according to every country, um, even changes depending on you know, the subject matter, whether you know, it can be um, film material versus a painting. And so having an awareness of all of these things to be e able to even do the copyright clearance in order to digitize is um, a huge barrier to entry for cultural institutions um, because most, most people often don't have that knowledge in house. Do you just, can I just jump in to say you've got two minutes left? Thanks, Joe. So close to wrapping up, uh, just some notes on a crowdsourced approach. If you are taking this approach yourself or thinking about it, uh, here are some of Andrea and I's reflections. Um, the advantage, of course, that it's agile and very low tech. You know, we just made a spreadsheet and we started filling it and making it bigger. Uh, we didn't need an IT department, any kind of permissions culture. Um, it allows you to make incremental updates. The survey is updated most weeks, so you know most people can get around a spreadsheet. Um, so it's uh, yeah a reasonably accessible way to to store and manage data. The survey has been community powered, as I mentioned, and it also avoids this thing of survey fatigue. Like, who really needs to be to get another survey? You know, the response rate is usually super low, so um, we, we kind of dodge that bullet. I hope. And uh, also, this is independent and inclusive. It's not owned by an institution. I think Andrea and I are hopefully can reasonably trusted um, positive actors in this space, and it's very much a kind of community driven. Um, initiative rather than being owned by anybody and it's easy to ask for expert help so 
Um, I've definitely got a little bit better at Wikidata from all this zero knowledge over the last three years. There are lots of people out there who will help you out with uh, any queries and help that you might need. Um, the challenge is, of course, is that uh, this approach relies on the discoverability of open data. We know, for example, that search engines like generally don't do a great job of surfacing uh, open access cultural heritage. And it does require commitment from the lead actors, so Andrea and I in this case mostly, uh, to keep it going and to keep it uh, active. So to read more about the survey, uh, I've written a few articles on Medium. Uh, here's a link to Open Glam Survey if you want to dig in a bit deeper. And we would like to thank you very, very much for listening, joining us today.